One of the great things about ROS is that it makes networking stuff super easy. So today we're gonna to see what you need to do to get your network set up for ROS. In this series, we've been looking at what you need to do to get ready to build robots with ROS, the things you need to get started. Last time we installed our computers and this time we're gonna look at how to set up our network. When you think about building a robot, being able to talk over the network seems like a really good idea. It lets us do things like remotely control our robot, have robots that can work together, or split up computation between different devices. The problem is that writing this networking code is normally really hard. What's great about ROS is all that hard work's taken care of for us. All we've got to do is make sure our devices are on the same network. So today we're going to look at different network structures you can use, how to use NetPlan to configure our network, how to set up remote access, and some ROS specific networking settings. That's a lot of stuff to cover, so let's get started. Now there are heaps of different ways you can structure your network and it's gonna depend a bit on your own hardware and your needs, but generally there are three key things we need our network to do for us. We need a fast, reliable connection between our devices to send ROS messages. We need an internet connection to be able to install ROS packages. And we need some degree of control over the network so that we can set up things like static IP addresses. So we're gonna look at a few different ways that you can structure your network, keeping those three ideas in mind. First up, the simplest structure is to just use an existing network, like your home, school, or workplace. In fact, this is so simple that you've probably already done it. Now, for many people, this is gonna be good enough and you can move on, but before you do, take a minute to just consider a few issues that you might run into. You don't have a whole lot of control over the network, so you might have trouble with things like IP conflicts or flaky reception. You're fixed to one location, so if you need to move your setup to do a field test or a demonstration, then nothing's gonna be able to communicate anymore. And also you can get ROS conflicts. If there's someone else on the same network also using ROS, then your stuff's gonna interfere with each other. If you think that any of these might affect you at some point, then you might wanna consider option number two, the ad hoc or access point network. This is where we set up one of the devices, I'd use the base station, to broadcast its own Wi-Fi network and have any other devices connect to it. Then to access the internet, we use a second network interface, either ethernet or a second Wi-Fi card, and share that connection to the other devices on the newly created network. This way, the base station and the robot stay connected to each other, no matter what's going on with the external connection, but they can still take advantage of that connection when it's available. This method gives us a lot of flexibility, but it also comes with a few downsides. It takes a bit of effort to configure. You need ethernet connection or a second Wi-Fi card or some really fiddly settings. And if you're constantly swapping out the base station, you can get yourself a bit stuck. To get rid of these problems, I suggest option number three, a dedicated network. Having a dedicated router gives us a solid network for all our devices to connect to that we have complete control over. The only problem is that this brand new network won't have an internet connection. Thankfully, there's a handy piece of equipment out there to solve this problem, and that's called a travel router. These small portable routers are designed to connect to the internet on one network, either ethernet, Wi-Fi, or USB tethering, and share that connection to its own network on ethernet and Wi-Fi. Normally, the idea is that when you're traveling, rather than having to reconfigure the Wi-Fi and VPN and whatever else on all your devices everywhere you go, you only need to connect your devices to the travel router once. As you travel, you then just connect the router to whatever networks you have access to, and all your devices will have a secure internet connection. It's not too hard to see how similar that is to our robot scenario. We want our robot, base station, and any other related devices on their own solid little private network, with internet access optionally bridged from an external source. So for my setup here, I've got this little travel router configured to connect to my home Wi-Fi, which is actually pretty patchy out here in the shed. It'll then share that internet connection to its own network via ethernet to the base station and via Wi-Fi to the Pi. I've also got it powered over USB from the base station. Now, obviously it is just one more thing to buy and to keep track of, so it might not be for everyone, but I seriously recommend it for how much it simplifies things. So now that we've picked a network structure, we need to actually configure it on our devices. Now you might be tempted to use the built-in network manager up in the top right hand corner and that's fine but I'm going to show you a better method using a tool called NetPlan. NetPlan is a built-in tool that lets you write your network settings into a config file. This makes it really easy to edit in the terminal, back it up or share it between computers. NetPlan doesn't actually handle any of the networking itself, all it does is provide a way to read a config file and translate that into a form that your operating system knows how to use. So I'm gonna walk us through how I set up these two machines using NetPlan. Obviously your scenario might be a bit different. Now before we write the config file, we need to figure out what settings we want. Things like the network interface name, whether we want DHCP, IP address, subnet, gateway, DNS servers, Wi-Fi info, that sort of thing. Now you're gonna to need to figure out most of this yourself, 
but the one thing I'll show you how to do is how to find the network interface name. This is what Linux uses to identify how it's going to connect. So open up a terminal and run the IP adder command. This will spew a whole lot of nonsense up on your screen, including the IP address that you might expect, but also the network names. Now generally, Ethernet ones are going to start with the letter E, and Wi-Fi is going to start with W. So in our case, we want WLAN 0 for the Pi. You'll need to figure out the rest of the settings yourself. For example, I already know the IP address of this router, which will be my gateway and name server. I've chosen static IP addresses for the devices that are outside of the DHCP range of the router. And I know the Wi-Fi login information, which I've just left as the default, but you should probably change it. So now that we've decided what settings we want, we can write the configuration file. NetPlan normally looks for its config files inside slash etc slash NetPlan, and a clean Ubuntu installation should already have an almost empty file in there called o1-network-manager-all.yaml. We could edit this file if we wanted to, but it's cleaner to create a second one. You can call it almost anything you like, but o2-my-network-config is nice and simple. Now creating this file requires root access, so you can either create it where you like and use sudo cp to copy it over, or create it with root directly. For example, to create it using the Pluma text editor, you would run sudo pluma slash etc slash netplan slash name of the file. Here you can see the contents of the config file for both of my machines, the Pi and the base station. This first bit is the same and tells netplan what it needs to do with the file. Then you have a section called Wi-Fi's to put your Wi-Fi stuff or Ethernet's to put your Ethernet stuff, IP address, subnet mask, gateway, DNS server, and Wi-Fi info. Hopefully your setup is similar enough that you can figure it out from there, otherwise there are some links in the description. Also, because it's YAML, make sure that you get the indenting correct, otherwise it'll get all cranky. Then to apply the changes, we just run sudo netplan generate and sudo netplan apply. And if everything went to plan, your network should now be up and running. You can see that my IP adder now shows the new address, and if I ping the dev machine, I'm getting a response. One little thing to be aware of, if you're using Wi-Fi, you might have to delete the old network manually. To do this, you'll have to go up to the start menu and go to advanced network configuration. The last part of our networking we need to set up is remote access. This is because although at the moment we've got a screen and keyboard and mouse connected to our Pi, once it's inside a robot we're going to be a bit stuck. I also recommend doing this on the base machine because you never know when it's going to come in handy. The most important type of remote access to set up is SSH. SSH, or Secure Shell, lets us open up a terminal remotely on another machine using the network. As well as a remote terminal for running commands, installing SSH gives us access to a bunch of other features, including using SCP to copy files, using X-forwarding to open graphical applications remotely, and using the VS Code remote development extension to open a workspace on a remote machine just as if it was on your local computer. So all we've got to do to install SSH is to open up a terminal and run sudo apt install open SSH server. Now to test it, we're going to swap to the dev machine, open a terminal, and enter ssh pi username at pi address. Now there are a whole lot of other types of remote access methods out there that let us do things like have a remote display or make file transfers easier. We're going to save those for a separate video down the track and just stick with ssh for now. Lastly, we're going to talk about some ROS-specific networking settings. In ROS1, if you wanted multiple machines to be able to talk to each other over the network, you had to set an environment variable on each one. The nice thing about ROS2 is that's all sorted out for us, it just works out of the box. The only time you need to change this setting is if you have multiple smaller ROS networks within a larger network. Like say you're in a classroom and you've got each student with their own separate ROS network, but they're all on the same LAN. If you think this is something that is going to apply to you, then I've got some links in the description below that will show you how to handle that. So that's it. Now that we've got our network fully set up, we can go ahead and install ROS. If you found this video interesting or helpful or you learnt something, please like and subscribe for more of this stuff. See you next time.